Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to EFSO's webinar brought to you by EFSO Middle East and North Africa chapter. My name is Hazim Al Momani, a consultant surgeon from Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates, and it's my greatest pleasure to introduce my colleagues today to discuss with us the topic of SAD ES, current and future practice. Today's presentation is brought to us by our dearest colleague, Dr. Ala Wafa. Ala joins us from Libya, the youngest society to join the IFSO MENAC chapter. Ala is an associate professor of surgery at Masrata University School of Medicine. He's an experienced surgeon performing thousands of these surgeries, and he's a member of the IFSO MENAC scientific committee. As for our panelists, I couldn't recommend anyone better to discuss with us, sadly, other than Professor Antonio Torres, past president of IFSO and past chairman of IFSO Board of Trustees. Professor Torres is one of the pioneers who popularized and helped the recognition of the sad -ES procedure. From Egypt, it is my greatest of pleasure to introduce Professor Ala Abbas. Professor Abbas is a professor of surgery at Ain Shams University in Cairo. He's the past head of bariatric surgery unit at Ain Shams and the current president of the Egyptian Society for Bariatric Surgery. And last but not least, we've got the one and only Professor Khalid Jodat. Professor Jodat is the current FSOMINAC president and he's an associate and advisory editor of obesity surgery. Without further delays, we will start the discussion and I'd like to remind all our audience to keep the discussion going you can post your questions live, and I can promise you I'll make sure that my discussants and panelists will answer them to you in real time. So without further delays, we'll start with Dr. Ala Wafa's presentation. Ala, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Hazel. Hello, everyone. This is Ala Wafa, and this is a presentation of Sadius, single and stomach, duodenal sleeve, current and future state. I have no disclosure. Proximal duodenoelial end to side bypass with sleeve gastrectomy, a proposed technique introduced by Antonio Torres and Andres Sanchez in November 2007 at San Carlos Hospital, Madrid. What is a SADS? It's a proximal duodenoelial end to side bypass with sleeve gastrectomy. It's a bariatric technique based on periopancreatic diversion duodenal switch in which the duodenum is anastomosed to the ileum in Belroth. To fashion. What is the theoretical benefit for operated patients are performance of one anastomosis, no mesentery opening and shorter operative time. Here I will present the first case which is a primary sadius, 34 year old male patient referred as a case of morbid obesity for further care with large BMI of 89, patient is hypertensive on ACE inhibitor obstructive sleep apnea on CBAP with apnea hypopnea index 47. Trial of semaglutide failed due to intolerance to side effect. Abja endoscopy revealed no gastroesophageal reflux disease and no hiatus hernia. All labs were normal and patient planned for sadness. Board positions are as seen. I use traditionally three 12 mm trocar, one 5 mm trocar, and one liver tractor, and sometimes adding 12 mm trocar infra umbilical. So after board inserted, laparoscopic subluration started. We found that there is some adhesions. We take down those adhesions using bipolar device. Then gastric dissection started by take down the greater curvature vessels toward the left crust of diaphragm. In such cases with high visceral obesity, we put the gauze to protect spleen and identifying the left cross of diaphragm. Then we excise the fat bed and after we finish our fundal dissection, dissection is then carried inferiorly all the way down along with the greater curvature vessels of the stomach up to the level of the duodenum. followed by 
posterior duodenal dissection and the hour limit of duodenal dissection is either identifying the gastroduodenal artery which is very difficult to identify in such case with visceral obesity or identifying a duodenopancreatic groove with vertical perforators and after we finish the dissection posteriorly we put the gauze and go for the supraduodenal dissection and create our supraduodenal window followed by starting of sleeve gastrectomy using Indo-GIA stabler over a 42 French bougie and make sure that the area of incisura angularis is wide because we need those patients to eat good amount of proteins and after we finish our sleeve gastrectomy we start over sewing of the stabler line from the gastroesophageal junction up down up to the incisura angularis and we don't go beyond the incisura angularis and we use 3O BDS suture for those over sewing then we start bowel measurement from identifying the terminal ileum at the level of the ileocecal junction we measure bowel 5 by 5 cm then rotate the bowel in anti-clockwise fashion and we measure 300 cm of the bowel and then we mark the bowel using clips to orient proximal and distal bowel loop then we put a tape at duodenal posterior duodenal window and make a vertical traction over the antrum to allow more length for duodenal calf and transect duodenum using into GIA stabler Furthermore, we start dissection and sacrificing the right gastric artery. It helps us for making attention-free anastomosis. Followed by starting our duodenoilial anastomosis using an absorbable 3O barbed suture and we start our first posterior layer always we make the suture very close to the mesentery of the small bowel these make us or allow us for more space anteriorly for duodenoilial anastomosis And after we finish first posterior layer, we create our duodenotomy using monopolar hook device, apply suction, identifying the mucosa of duodenum healthy, there is no any ischemia, then create ileotomy and start our second posterior layer using the same absorbable barbed suture in continuous manner and after finish second posterior layer we insert the bougie along with duodenum up to the ileum and those technique help us from and protect us from backwalling during the anastomosis of the first anterior layer and also protect narrowing of the anastomosis Then, after we finish the first anterior layer of the anastomosis, 
we start the second anterior layer of the anastomosis using the same parved suture absorbable 3O suture and after we finish the anastomosis we're making a leak test it was negative and this is the final look of the anastomosis patient discharged home and post operative day 2 with no complaint diet gradually advanced last seen 3 months post operatively doing well and BMI is 71 case number 2 is a revision sleeve gastrectomy to sad yes for 3 year old female patient status post laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy 3 years back with suboptimal weight loss before sleeve gastrectomy her BMI was 77 neither BMI is 58 at presentation her BMI is 67 and weight is 173 kg patient has type 2 diabetes on insulin with history of laparoscopic cholestectomy two years back upper giant endoscopy revealed no gas or sphygia reflux and no hiatus hernia so here is the upper GI series for the previous sleeve gastrectomy it shows fusiform dilatation of the sleeve with slight dilated fundus and there is no any twisting or gastroesophageal reflux disease so port inserted laparoscopic subluration started we identify some adhesions between the liver and previous sleeve gastrectomy we take down those adhesions using bipolar device gastric dissection started and carried on all the way superiorly we take down all the adhesions between the gastric sleeve and the greater amentum and posterior gastric attachments we identify the fundus then we complete the section of the fundus up to the level of the left cross of diaphragm and after we finish our fundal dissection we complete adhesiolysis up to the level of the duodenum and furthermore we excise dilated fundus using into GIA stabler followed by over sewing of the stabler line using 3O absorbable barbed suture then the, the, the section carried on posteriorly along with the duodenum start by the lateral duodenal wall dissections and followed by posterior duodenal dissections we identify our landmark gastrodudinal artery pulsation duodenal pancreatic group with vertical perforators then we put the goes at the posterior duodenal space and go for the sobraduodenal dissection identifying the goes creating duodenal window we put the tape we make a vertical traction over antrum make duodenal cuff as long as possible we transect duodenum followed by the section and sacrificing of the right gastric artery for tension free anastomosis start power measurement by identifying terminal ileum ileocecal junction measure 5 by 5 centimeter rotate the bowel in anti-clockwise fashion we measure 300 centimeter of the bowel same as in primary SADI we make our marker by clips to identify the proximal and distal bowel loop then we start duodenal ileal anastomosis using 3O absorbable barbed suture and followed by making duodenotomy identifying healthy mucosa of the duodenum creating the ileotomy start the second posterior layer of the anastomosis and 
after we finish this layer we insert the bougie as mentioned before through the ilium to protect against back walling of the anastomosis and here we start the first anterior layer of the anastomosis followed by the second and last anterior layer of the anastomosis after we finish suturing of the anastomosis so we making a leak test was negative then we insert drain to conclude our surgery so patient discharged home post abort for day two doing well with no complaint diet gradually advanced last seen six months post operatively doing well pmi going down to 47 weight 120 kg with excess weight loss percentage of 45.1 percent now we start with the first literature which is a long-term result of single anastomosis due to ileal uh, bypass with sleeve gastrectomy by Andre Sanchez and Antonio Torres. Uh, there were 164 patients under one side yes from 2007 to 2015 with mean PMI is 45.8. A limb length is different between 200 centimeter, 250 and 300 cm with the follow-up was 84.7 percent at five years and 75 percent at 10 years. So this is the result of the weight loss in 1, 5 and 10 years with the excess weight loss percentage at 1 year is 95.5% at 5 years is 87.8% at 10 years is 80.4% Let's look for the improvement of the comorbidity starting by arterial hypertension which is decreased from 56% preoperatively to 25% at 5 years and only 14% at 10 years and obstructive sleep apnea preoperatively was 54% and 5 years about 5% and 10 years only 2% having obstructive sleep apnea with a total of 88 patients with type 2 diabetes remission seen in 72.7% at 5 years and only in 55.7% at 10 years of follow-up and what about the malnutrition and uh, long-term complications of the SADIS? Here we see 12 patients have been submitted to revisional surgery for the recurrent hypoproteinemia, which is 7.3%. Seven of them in the initial group of 200 centimeter common limb, which is formed 14%, and five among those with 250 centimeter, which is formed 5%. And none of those with 300 centimeter common channel so the malnutrition is strongly really related to the length of the common channel next literature is one anastomosis gastric bypass versus single anastomosis due to leostomy with sleeve a comparative analysis of 30-day outcome by Benjamin Club and their colleague there were 694 SADS and 1068 one anastomosis gastric bypass Within 2020 and 2021, SADS patient has higher perioperative PMI of 50 and more American Society of Anesthesiology score for 9.9%, while operative time significantly longer in SADS than in the one anastomosis gastric bypass. A 30 day outcome for SADS and one anastomosis gastric bypass based on Cleveland Dendo classification, we found that the Incidence of complications said is slight more than that of one anastomosis gastric bypass, but the statistically significant complication seen more at grade 2 classifications and grade 4b classification. And here we compare SADIS and one anastomosis gastric bypass, a 30 day outcome in form of readmissions, reoperation, and reinterventions. The statistically significant only seen in readmissions, which is more in SADI, is with 3.7%, while one anastomosis gastric bypass is 1.9%. So, the conclusion of the study SADI has higher readmission rate, higher rates of Cleveland Dendro grade 2 and grade 4b complications. To note, SADI 
patient has higher BMI, further study is needed to determine the long-term complication profile and efficacy of both operations. And here the other literature, which is a comparison between a single versus a double anastomosis duodenal switch in the management of obesity, a meta-analysis systemic review by Hayato Nakaneshi and colleague. There were six studies are included with total of 1,847 patients. Uh, 818 patients are sadius and 1,029 peripancreatic diversion within a switch. Preoperative BMI was similar between two groups. And here we see the studies which is included in the literature, which is a five retrospective study and one prospective cohort study. Uh, the follow-up at two years for the sadius is 69% and peripancreatic diversion is 72%. But in 60 months, uh, sadius is about 59% uh, and pyrubancreatic diversion is 72%. So the follow-up for pyrubancreatic diversion is much more in number. With outcome of sadius and pyrubancreatic diversion with duodenal switch at 1, 2 and 3 years, the result was excellent for two procedures with slight more uh, better results. Uh, for sadius than that of peripancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. And now let's look for the perioperative outcome comparison between sadius and peripancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. Uh, we have seen revisional surgery is much more for the peripancreatic diversion is 9.5% while 3.4% for sadius and the long term complications which is a 26.5% peripancreatic diversion and only 13.9% said yes. So, among the long term complication, what is the major difference was observed between two groups? Here we have seen the incisional hernia in said yes is 8.1%, and in pyrubancreatic diversion and duodenal switch is 13%. And clinical significant protein deficiency in said yes is 1.3%, but in pyrubancreatic diversion and duodenal switch is 8.3%. Small bowel obstruction and said yes have seen is only 1.3% while in peripancreatic diversion and duodenal switch is 6%. Here we see the abnormal lab value and nutritional deficiency outcome comparison between said yes and peripancreatic diversion and duodenal switch at two years, which is uh, nearly the same results between two procedures. So what's the conclusion of this study in comparison of the pyrubancreatic diversion due to the switch to SADIS? SADIS seems to be effective and safe bariatric operation. It appears that SADIS has a few long-term complications and few post-operative nutritional deficiency with comparable comorbidity remission rates compared with the pyrubancreatic diversion due to the switch. But long-term randomized control trials are required to help further strengthen the rule of SADIS in management of the obesity. Here is a comparison between primary SADIS versus post-leaf gastrectomy SADI by Barajas and his colleague, a total of 783 patients, 488 underwent primary SADIS and 295 underwent post-leaf gastrectomy SADI. The main BMI at time of surgery is 45.1 for primary sadius and 51.4 for post-leaf gastrectomy SADI. So here we're comparing the perioperative factors and postoperative complications between primary sadius and post-leaf gastrectomy SADI. We found that the results are equal or near to each other with no that significant difference. So the conclusion of the study demonstrated that the post leave gastrectomy SADI is safe with similar 30-day complication rate to primary SADIS. Post leave gastrectomy SADIS has longer operative time but shorter length of stay. This is a comparison between SADIS and Runway gastric bypass after failed sleeve gastrectomy, medium term outcome by Philip and their colleague from 2007 up to 2017, 141 patients receiving revisional laparoscopic surgery after sleeve gastrectomy, 63 patients are sadius and 78 patients are on Y gastric bypass. A percentage of total weight loss after revisional surgery comparing sadius are on Y gastric bypass in the first five years. Here we see from this study significantly uh, sadius 
has better weight loss than that of Ron Y gastric bypass in the first five years post revision of sleeve gastrectomy. So here we com we comparing the short and long term complications between SADIS and Ron Y gastric bypass, where we have seen there is no statistically difference between SADIS and Ron Y gastric bypass in form of short term complications, but in long term complication we have seen that SADIS has less long-term complication than that of Ronoi gas bypass, which is reached up to the 26.9%. So the conclusion of the study, converting sleeve gastrectomy to SADIS, a result in significantly more weight loss than conversion to Ronoi gas bypass, up to four years post-revision. Average quality of life scores over time did not differ between SADIS and Ronoi gas bypass. The rate of percentage of complication and micronutrient deficiency was similar, therefore conversion from sleeve gastrectomy into Runway gastric bypass is not preferred procedure unless gastrogeal reflux or functional problem related to sleeve gastrectomy are the primary indication for revisional surgery. And here we will discuss in this literature uh, a complication which is happening in lobe anastomosis which is a bi-reflux after SADIS, a meta-analysis of 2,029 patients by Ray Portela and colleague. There were seven uh, studies included, published between 2010 and 2020, with total number of patients was uh, 1,029 patients. Main follow-up is 10.3 months. And here we have the results of the bioreflex after SADIS for the seven studies, which is def differ from the uh, 0% up to 7.5%, and the highest number of the bioreflex seen in the study from Russia by Yashkov and colleague. Uh, but uh, we have some points for these studies. The only two studies have uh, mentioned the diagnostic tool for the bioreflex, and most of the studies uh, did not mention uh, what happened after diagnosis of bioreflux regarding uh, follow-up and uh, management and uh, how many patients need uh, revisional surgery and what type of revision done for each patient. So the conclusion of the study, bioreflux has not been demonstrated to be a problematic after SADIS in this meta-analysis. However, the lack of long-term follow-up and overall low to moderate methodological quality of the included studies could have lead to under prediction further prospective multicentric studies are required to assess the complication rates of these events after sadies so the american society of metabolic and bariatric surgery guidelines and position statement for single anastomosis due to a switch after reviewing the articles and studies regarding this procedure they recommend that sadies a modification of classical ron wide duodenal switch is therefore endorsed by ASMBS as an appropriate metabolic bariatric surgical procedure and the publication of long-term safety and efficacy outcome is still needed and is strongly encouraged particularly with published details on sleeve gastrectomy size and common channel length. The EFSU position statement regarding SADIS, which is updated in 2020 after reviewing of all articles and studies based on the existing data, they recommend SADIS has uh, substantial weight loss and improvement in the metabolic health, which is maintained into the medium term, nutritional deficiency emerging as a long safety concerns for SADIS, so long-term multidisciplinary care follow-up are needed, surgeon performing SADIS and other Bariatric metabolic procedure encouraging to participate in a national and international registry so data may be effectively identified. If so, supports SADIS as a recognized bariatric and metabolic procedure but highly encourages randomized control trial in the near future. Thank you so much and see you in IFSO Melbourne 2024. Amazing presentation, Ala. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Before we start speaking to the colleagues, we've got a few questions from the floor, and I'd like to encourage all our attendees to type their questions at the Q&A section. Ala, can you talk us through where do you stand? You've described where you place your ports. 
at the time of the surgery, where do you stand? Between the patient, on the patient's uh, left or the patient's I, right? I, I stand between the legs, but during the anastomosis, I stand on the left side of the patient. Professor Torres, do you have any other preference with regard to where the surgeon should position him or herself? I think, you know, it's going to be very important to, to point out that the versatility of putting the patient in the French position, uh, uh, you know, in the opposite of the American position, you know, not opening the, the, the leg of the patient, because in this way, with the French position, you are able to go uh, to the, in between the leg, to the left side, to the right side, and I think it's going to be the more versatile position. I agree with uh, Dr. Wafa that it's going to be starting between the leg, performing the dissection, and for performing the anastomosis, you can do both, or between the legs or in the left side of the patient, depending on the only patient and your, and your position in being in feeling you are comfortable uh, where you are. Fair enough. The next question, and I'll ask uh, Professor uh, Ala Abbas, is with regard to, have you ever had a situation where you thought it wasn't possible to lift the small bowel to do your duodenal ileal anastomosis, and you ended up adopting or performing a two-stage sad yes. Is that something possible that you would have done before or you would recommend in the event of finding it impossible to do a one-stage sad yes? Uh, adding to the point, so first of all, thank you, Hazim, for the very uh, hot topic we are discussing today. And thank you for Dr. Ala Awafa for a very comprehensive presentation. I also li uh, like to thank Professor Torres and uh, Professor Gauda to share with us today. As regards the position uh, of the surgeon, uh, in my point of view that the most important part of, of getting to the left hand side of the patient and actually going towards the, the patient's shoulder is when you count the bowel. To start from the cecum upwards when you are in between the legs of the patient uh, is it's really a hard job. When you move to the left side, counting the bowel and manipulating it, uh, especially if you go up to the upper abdomen and your instruments and camera directed towards the right iliac fossa makes life much easier. Then you can do the anastomosis from the left side or you go back to the, between the patient's legs. There are so many tricks to try to get the bowel easy. If you are uh, having a very huge patient, you can always try to minimize the size of the greater momentum between the uh, bowel and the uh, duodenum by creating a curtain or a window or cutting into this. Uh, what uh, Dr. Ala Wafa showed us, uh, which seems to be his routine, is uh, dividing the right gastric artery, makes actually the duodenum goes down below the transverse colon. Uh, with the sleeve mobilized uh, nicely from both sides, so it, it's always very easy to go down. Maybe the only hurdle of getting the small bowel up is having a patient who had multiple previous intra-abdominal open surgery where the bowel is stuck. And in this situation, then you, you may have to even preoperatively uh, mention to the patient because of the previous multiple abdominal surgeries you had on your small bowel, uh, in the abdomen, you may uh, have it into two stages when you do the sleeve and wait when the patient loses weight so you can handle the adhesions uh, much better with the fat in the momentum being lost again and the mesentery of the small bowel uh, with a successful sleeve. Then uh, a, a second stage would be uh, easier uh, for this situation. Perfect. Well, uh... I'd like to welcome Professor Kelvin Higa, who's joined the discussion today, and he's got a couple of uh, curved ball questions here. Uh, I'll address them to Professor Jodet. I don't think there's anyone better to answer these questions than Professor Jodet. So Professor Higa is asking, given the data presented by uh, Ala Wafa, is there any reason to do the ruin y duodenal switch anymore? And do you believe that if you are to perform the ruin y duodenal switch, you'd be able to achieve more weight loss than the SADES, Professor Jodet? So I, I don't get it. Is is the question run Y versus do the switch or no? Uh, yeah, I, I, the, I or the, the difference between the SADES and the 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 Dina switch. I think the problem with bariatric surgery is that the more difficult the procedure is, the less adopters you're gonna get to. So if you keep saying do dinner switch, do dinner switch, do dinner switch, 
Yeah, this has been historically only 2% of the bariatric procedures are the malabsorptive type duodenal switch uh, style uh, procedures. And the SADS is going to help to increase this number and increase the adaptation. So if the results are comparable, of course, where uh, the easy always wins. So we are going to move to see a good move into SADS versus the duodenal switch. And probably the uh, duodenal switch will have very few centers uh, doing them later. I agree. Professor Torres, any comments about this uh, interesting question? Absolutely. You know, Dr. Higa, you know, put the point, you know, of the most uh, challenging issue. I think I agree with uh, 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 Dr. Yabad regarding there is no way uh, taking into account the different uh, information, the different num numbers of the different studies to perform a primary one way uh, a switch or after fail in other procedure, main as lead. I think studies have shown that uh, it can get a very, very nice result, very similar uh, to the donor switch that even more having less uh, complication, not only technical complication, short term, but also long term complication. I think there is no way to design to indicate uh, primary or revision of the a standard one way during a switch at present time. Regarding the other question that Dr. Higa put on the table is, uh, does conversion of studies to one way give more weight loss? Uh, well, I, I really, I, I don't think so. Maybe in some uh, very, very uh, uh, special cases. I think the only, uh, the only uh, cases we have uh, here converting a standard studies in the Ruan Wilderness switch was a couple of cases due to uh, bile reflux. But uh, I don't think so. You know, if we have a patient uh, with uh, weight regain or not losing enough weight after SADIS procedure, I think now we have in our armamentarium medication, it can help a lot. And also, you can check, you know, how going to be the sleeve going on. I think since the sleeve is dilated, you can think in doing the sleeve later on. And, and coming back to, to this point, I saw Dr. Wafa approach after the studies after the sleeve. I think I don't agree, you know, to do the sleeve at the same time at the studies because he removed, yes, you know, two centimeters of fundus. I don't think it's going to be adding a huge, uh, uh, important result to the patient. Uh, more, uh, even more, taking into account the, you know, the difficulty, the challenging uh, dissection in some cases, you know, of the previous mm -hmm. leaves. That's an addition to the liver, some addition to the pancreatic bed. Uh, I, I don't think advisable to do as a revisional procedure if the leaf is very nicely performed to add the red sleeve at the same time. But anyway, fair enough. Well, I think the, the floor is just booming with questions. I'll ask uh, Ala Wafa, please. Ala, we've got a few questions with regard to workup, the assessment, and the selection of the procedure with regard to the SADS. When would you recommend it as a primary procedure? When would you recommend it as a revisional procedure? What criteria would you use to consider it as a primary procedure? If you can elaborate more, you probably could answer a couple of questions from the floor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hazen, for the question. This is a very difficult to answer it because uh, uh, we in our centers, we uh, in the primary in primary study, we did it only in a cases of the BMI of uh, more than 50. We didn't do any studies for uh, cases if uh, BMI is less than 50. And uh, in revision, both sleeve gastrectomy, we have to do the upper GI endoscopy, we have to do the uh, upper GI series. Uh, make sure that the patient has not any gastroesophageal reflux disease. There is no any twist, any problem with the sleeve gastrectomy. So we proceed for SADIS and uh, the PMI must be more than 50 also. So uh, I didn't do any SADIS for patient less than uh, 50 of uh, BMI. But I have uh, I have to comment about uh, Dr. Uh, Torres uh, technique. I know that Dr. Torres, I was there in Madrid. Uh, I know that Dr. Torres uh, is not doing uh, a re-sleeve and uh, SADI at the same time, even if the stomach is uh, big. So I will ask him one question. If you have uh, patients coming to you, uh, you did a SADI and he came again and you did a sleeve gastrectomy for him. So this uh, lead to decrease more weight in your uh, experience or the weight loss outcome after that it's uh, very few. I don't know. No, if I understood well, do, do you mean the, to perform re-sleeve 
plus studies at the same time? No, no, no. I, you, you, you did the study, yes, and patient uh -huh. is not losing weight uh, very well. So uh -huh. Then you go back and do a re-sleeve. That leads to a good uh, weight loss outcome or no? Oh, yeah, you're right. We have some cases, uh, you know, we, we did rest leave after study procedure. But the result is very, 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 very little, very, very, not, not very positive. This is the reason I already said that medication can help better in this, in this uh, uh, scenario. Uh, and I think, you know, if the medication fails, we can think in performing rest leave. Dr. Higa pointing out again, pointing, you know, another important question. Would you yes. ever shorten common channel after study for more weight loss? We already did in a couple of cases, but do you summing up the two reasons of converting studies in wrong wider than so it was biliary reflux and not losing enough uh, weight. But the result again are not very uh, important. I think, you know, if the patient uh, regain weight after studies and or not losing enough weight, we have to to think in, in, in adding some other issue. I, I'm thinking medication. And as yeah. uh, Dr. Dilleman said many years ago, to do a brain transplantation for this patient. Surgery is not a solution for this patient. Well, I think you've, you've answered it quite well, Professor Torres. I could see Professor Abbas raising his hand. Professor Abbas? Yes, I would like to add for the indication of the primary. We have to remember that the study is, uh, is uh, mainly a metabolic uh, surgery. So we have to remember also that we had to change our uh, limits of uh, high metabolic We run down from the 35 to the 34 uh, patient with metabolic disease. And I think this applies the same on using the SADIS in primary cases. You don't have, in my opinion, wait for the patient to have BMI of above uh, 50. The patient with BMI of above 40 or 45, we are still good candidates if they have a strong metabolic disease. Patients with a hemoglobin C above 11 who are going for the surgery mainly to get rid of themselves of diabetes or control it better. Patients with severe hypercholesterolemia. I have done cases like this, and they actually they are uh, physicians and uh, a, a gynecologist uh, whose BMI was 42, and all his uh, uh, uncles and fa father uh, died from a uh, very young age from coronary artery disease from severe familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and it was very, very strange that the uh, uh, result as regards uh, lipid profile going back to normal uh, is, is, is been there for more than 10 years now. So we have to remember that it is a strong metabolic operation. Indication is is there at the metabolic disease rather than sticking to the BMI. Very, very valid point. Professor Jodet, I do have a question with regards to, is it fair to compare SADI S to SASI, considering, quote, unquote, the good results of weight loss of SASI? Well, we, we don't have enough literature or comparisons to, to, to come to a firm conclusion, but, you know, uh, SASE was invented because of trying to make an operation easy, not because of scientific uh, reasons. It's just, uh, this is much easier, so let's do that. And uh, we don't have any uh, good follow-up data on it. Uh, SASE, yes, the other way around, had good enough uh, uh, comparison, with, especially with limb lengths and stuff, uh, before being established. So uh, it's not even a fair comparison. You're, com you're comparing a standard procedure to a non-standard procedure. I agree. And we need to remind the audience of the if so statement with regard to uh, investigational procedure. At the minute, SASE is not an endorsed procedure by any society. Professor Torres, another question from Dr. Higa. Closure of mesenteric defects. Do you have any evidence, any data, any thoughts that you would like to share with us? We could see that Allah did not close it, and he mentioned this in his discussion. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, Dr. Kiga, you know, pointing out, you know, the more challenging question. I think we, we don't close the mesentery defect in our department. Uh, and I think, you know, it's uh, sometimes going to be more challenging to close perfect uh, in a proper way than not close it. In. When I'm operating outside home, you know, in different centers, uh, I used to close it. Because just in case, you know, we have only one case of uh, 
Peter saying earlier in our experience, more than almost 1,000 cases. Um, I mean, you know, if uh, uh, you are not sure of uh, how to manage the patient, if your patient can be not uh, having a, a nice close follow-up, uh, we are having 80% in year result, you are, uh, have some concern regarding that, my advice at present time would be you must close the nostalgia effect. But in this uh, uh, in this um, uh, in this situation, uh, you must add uh, uh, another uh, five millimeter trucker or a couple of them downwards because sometimes the very very patient to pull up, you know, all the momentum to find the mesocolon and to put and to close the mesenteric defect is a very challenging issue. You have to put to 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 introduce a couple of. Uh, uh, um, a trucker uh, downwards in terms of having facilitating your your closer, but being uh, you know uh, summarizing my 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 point, we don't, don't we don't have enough data. You know, we have a one case of uh, or a couple of cases of uh, patient saying uh, herniation in uh, Dr. Cotton experience in in Utah, and um, a couple of them they had previous operation. They was due some incision. I think in summary, we don't have enough data advising us to close in a systematic uh, way, but I think if you have some concern, you know, you, you, you can't close it, but it's going to be, in some sense, challenging to you to, to do that in a very systematic way. I hear you. Well, I think your answer is quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, Professor Abbas, do you perform uh, SADIS as a two-stage procedure? And if you do that, and while the patient is waiting for the second stage, should she or he develop reflux? How would you approach this case? Very, very intelligent question. Agree. We uh, go for uh, two stages, uh, sad yes, really for the very tough uh, technical cases, BMI above 100 or above 90, when the situation will be very difficult. And uh, we try to use it the original way with uh, Dr. Garnier started the sleeve to minimize the weight for the second procedure, the second step of the procedure will be uh, easier. The first operation will be quicker. Uh, the problem of uh, developing GERD after the first mm -hmm. sleeve can be due to uh, multiple reasons because we are sure that the GERD is, is not only due to uh, the uh, Marble diversity, but may well be a technical issue with the sleeve, twisted sleeve, structured sleeve. Uh, all these are really contraindication for going into uh, SADI S because uh, you cannot correct this by doing an anastomosis, uh, the ileal blow, and this reflux problem will continue. Then you have to salvage the problematic sleeve by doing a ruin Y gastric bypass above the uh, area of uh, problem in the sleeve. And uh, uh, obviously, you have to modify the limb lenses for that row and why in a big patient uh, making the biliopancreatic limb quite longer than usual uh, to get good results from from this operation because the standard row and why uh, after sleeve will uh, always cure the reflux but do not add any uh, more weight loss. I agree, I agree. Uh, Professor Jodet, we've got a couple of questions about would you consider performing a prophylactic laparoscopic cholecystectomy at the same time of performing a SADES? What are your thoughts? I don't think there's a need for that. If you have gold stones, yes, take the gallbladder out. But if you have a normal abdominal ultrasound preoperative, you just wait. And if you get gold stones, just take them out if they're, they're symptomatic. So... Uh, I don't think we have a different policy than the others because if you add a cholecystectomy, it has its own set of, you know, every step you add to the procedure, you have a new set of complications added. So if you do a run y you have the JJ anastomosis uh, uh, issues. Yeah, if you do the gallbladder, you have this gallbladder issues. Yes, it's minimal, but uh, you can run into problems with that. So I, I only do that if indicated. Okay. Allah, I could see you raising your hand. Yeah. Would you like to give it, share your thoughts? Yeah. And I've got a question for you yeah. afterwards. Yeah, I have one technical question to Dr. Torres because I have seen him. He's doing a two technique of uh, duodenal ileal anastomosis. He did the stabler technique and hands-on technique. Did he see any difference in the results of uh, two type or this 
two techniques because I have seen uh, articles by uh, Pablo Fino and uh, their colleague in 2020 in Obesity Surgery Journal. They found that the Stabler technique has a uh, highest rate of leak than that of hands-on technique uh, from 10% to 0.7%. So uh, what's your answer, Dr. Torres? Okay, I think when we we are now performing a study, a professional study comparing, you know, uh, a stapler and astomosis versus hands-on and astomosis, uh, and then we have uh, almost uh, included forty cases in each arm. We don't, we didn't find yet any differences, but it's going to be important to point out know, that Dr. Wafa question is very important. The technical uh, uh, nuances of performing a nice stapler and astomosis are very important. My advice is no introduce a cartridge longer than 30 millimeters. You introduce a cartridge at 45, you can do, but it's going to be more challenging to introduce, you know, the both jaws of the stapler in the duodenum and in the ileum. So be aware of that. And in this sense, you know, you can do that uh, very nicely. It's going to be uh, a very reproductible uh, approach to perform the anastomosis. It's going to be very important, very, very easily uh, performed. But the, my advice is not uh, introduce a cartridge greater than 30 millimeters. I know not, or not all the devices on all the stapler at present time has, uh, they have, you know, a 30 millimeter cartridge. But okay, you can use 45, introduce less, but we know that to have an astomosis 2.5 centimeter doing the study procedure more than enough, but having a very nice uh, possibility period, a very nice as well on process. Very good answer. Ala, Ala Wafa, question to you with regards to when you're working your patients up for a study S and should you find that they've got esophagitis, would that change your management? And how would you approach this case? A primary case. Uh, a primary case and uh, in our giant endoscopy, there is an esophagitis, yeah? Yeah. No, yeah. I, will, I, I will not do a set, yes. I will go for Ronwai gastric bypass. What about the rest of the uh, panel? Any opinions with that regard, please? I think, you know, in my opinion, uh, uh, Hassan is going to be important, you know, to to define properly what is going to be the girl. I mean, those patients that we have uh, or very symptomatic before surgery or having uh, endoscopic findings of uh, huge esophagitis or barrette esophagus, in those patients, we perform a, a complete workup in this patient. I mean, we perform uh, endoscopy for sure. You perform uh, pH imagery 24. Uh, four hours pH metry, and also we do uh, impedance manometry. Then, if the girl of the patient is really pathological, I mean, the Demister score is over 50 and the uh, percentage of pH less than four is uh, 20, uh, we don't do a study procedure. We do a run white gastric bypass with the longer really pancreatic limb. But on the other hand, if, if, you, if, if this girl is not so important, uh, you must be, we must be aware that the most important anti reflux uh, mechanism is to lose weight. And Sadis uh, got this uh, principle very nicely. Good answer. Professor Jodet, I can see you raising your hand. Professor Jodet, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think I, I need to comment on a sore issue that we did not discuss. Uh, I've been a friend of uh, Nicolas Coconaro for a very long time, and uh, he's the master of malabsorption, or as we call it now, hypoabsorption, to just decrease the term. Uh, we have to know that SADIS is not uh, a procedure that should be performed with medical tourism, because when you do a, a, a malabsorption procedure or a hypoabsorptive procedure, unless you follow up the patients for life, you're actually implanting, implanting a time bomb that would explode at one point. We, did, we just heard uh, that the 25 and 30 year uh, outcomes of the BPD of the Nicolas Copenaro with 250 alimentary limb. With, and they had a lot of liver failures and liver transplantation issues. So unless we, we treat SADIS, DIA and, and Udina switches as different procedures from the other non so much hypoabsorptive procedures, we need to have a good system for follow up for life for these patients. So what do you think, uh, Antonio? I think it's a crucial point. I think, you know, it's, it's coming back, you know, to the uh, question that Dr. Suleiman is asking, yeah, in, ca in case of severe hyperproteinemia, what does the revision uh, do for him? I think it's very nice. Another important positive uh, characteristic of the SADIC procedure 
is that we can uh, uh, revise the procedure very nicely. As a patient, you know, uh, you can be sure that the, the protein level of the patient is very is, 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 is correct. You can dismantle the previous anastomosis, just put a stapler, fire the stapler, and then, you know, go upwards, uh, even one meter, two meter, or uh, we have a couple of cases with some liver failure. We do the duodenal jejuno anastomosis, the, the, the Taiwanese people and the Japanese people do is a proximal satis. It means a duodenal one anastomosis duodenal jejunostomy. I think going to be important in terms of uh, getting with this uh, issue. Uh, I know, you know, we have to uh, to have a, a close follow up. As Doctor uh, Gabad uh, said, it's going to be important. But we must to be aware that all the uh, bariatric procedure, including a sleep gastrectomy, all those patients has to be supplemented. And the pro the, the 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 positive way with the study our patient in study procedure, the patient are having. Estatin for uh, this epidemic, uh, antihypertensive medication, uh, metformin or insulin, and they are changing all of these medication for for the supplementation. Is the way we we approach our patient is you have having so many medication before the surgery, then we're gonna change uh, for having just supplementation. It's gonna be the way of being aware of the patient, inform the patient how important is the supplementation. But anyway, if we have some cases, again, the study procedure is very versatile to reconvert in a proximal, more proximal studies, increasing the length of the common channel. Thank you, thank you all. A question again from Dr. Kelvin Heger. I'll ask Professor Abbas, please. Blue duodenum, when do you become concerned? So, uh, sorry, Hazim, can you repeat the question, please? It's a question from uh, Dr. Kelvin Heger about uh, a dusky blue duodenum. When will you become concerned? Yes, uh, this is actually an important uh, point. Uh, if you have the luxury of uh, ICG, in you can test uh, the... Uh, viability of the duodenal stump prior to the anastomosis. If you don't have this luxury, you can give it time and you do uh, a very nice uh, test. Dr. Ala Wafa mentioned in his technique, uh, once you open the duodenum, you can actually see the mucosa from inside and you see how healthy it is, how the edges are uh, bleeding, then you get reassured that uh, you have a viable uh, area to anastomose to. Professor Torres, any take? You no, know, we uh, now are using a systematic way in those cases, uh, ICG uh, in those cases, but we, we must take into account we don't divide in a systematic way the right gastric artery. Uh, we exceptionally divide it, you know, if there are some uh, issue regarding pulling up the ileum to the duodenum, but I think, honestly, I think, you know, if you do perform a distal dissection of the duodenum close to this pancreatic duodenal angle, uh, generally speaking, uh, you don't need to divide the right gastric artery. There is no way that you preserve the right gastric artery, the blood supply will be better. But, uh, you know, completing the answer to the Torhige, you know, uh, of course, you know, the blue uh, duodenum is a, a, a question is concerning. But, you know, we have the information about, uh, about all the uh, Professor Marchesini experience, you know, leaving all the stomach through the left gastric artery. We don't have any problem regarding this ischemia of the duodenum. We only had one case that probably some not only dividing the right gastric artery, but also having some problem. The patient came back uh, 10 days after the operation with a complete blow up. Of the, uh, of the duodenal ileum anastomosis. Even in this case, in an emergency situation, again, the versatility of the procedure is very nice. You can dismantle everything and to ruin y gastric bypass. To go up, you know, the sleeve is already performed and you can perform ruin y gastric bypass. In this so, I mean, dramatic in inverted commas uh, situation. I think that's a very good point. I. If you guys don't mind and your time allows, I'd like to extend this discussion a bit further. It's quite a topical issue. It's very interesting. There's a lots of engagement from the floor. Uh, my question to you, Ala, and there'll be a lot of young surgeons watching someone like yourself performing such a potent operation. 
Can you talk us through your learning curve and how did you reach this level of competency and what would your advice would be for those who are watching you and wanting to do this surgery? Yeah, yeah. This is this is a very difficult uh, uh, surgery. It's not an easy. You are uh, anastomosing the duodenum to the ileum with complete hands-on anastomosis. Uh, we uh, go a multiple courses with uh, the expertise like Antonio Torres, Gerd Brager, who's doing it in a routine fashion. We see a different technique from both of them. And uh, after that, we have a lot of uh, primary bariatric procedures like anastomosis gastric bypass, runway gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and revisional surgery that uh, increasing the skills of the bariatric surgeons before it's going to the Shasta complicated uh, surgery like a SADIS. And uh, we, uh, we bought uh, some criteria for this surgery and we didn't do it uh, for uh, any patient. But uh, I have uh, one question for uh, Dr. Torres regarding the post uh, SADIS malnutrition and revision. He uh, told that he's going for a runway gastric bypass and after dismantling of the duodenoiliac anastomosis. So why we didn't uh, transect the periopancreatic limb proximally and then we transect the alimentary limb just a one meter distal to the anastomosis and then we connect both together and put the alimentary limb whatever we want. Well, it's an option. So, so, so with this, with this technique, we keep the mylors. Yeah. No. 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 I mean, uh, you know, uh, 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 you, you mean in the, in, in the presence of malnutrition, you, you said? Yeah. 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 Okay. No, if, when when you are revising the study is for malnutrition. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. We we maintain the parallels still. We only uh, put a stapler at the level of the previous anastomosis. You know, as the patient already is really malnourished, it's very thin. You know, it's not not anymore fat. Yeah. You know, we put the stapler, we divide the, the duodenum at the level of the ileum. Just one stapler or two maximum, yeah. uh, taking care of not uh, producing, inducing some stenosis in the ileum. And then, you know, you have a new duodenal stamp. And then you can add words, you know, uh, uh, increasing the length of the common channel as far as you can, as you want. I mean... Even, as I said previously, you can go as proximal as to the jejunum, uh, you know, mimicking, you know, the, the procedure that Taiwanese people, Japanese people, you know, are performing. Uh, Dr. Kasama, you know, has a lot of experience that CK, CK1, you know, in Taiwan are doing a, a, a duodenal jejunostomy, proximal studies, I would say. Okay, uh, can I ask you another question? Did, did, did you uh, examine that tone of the pylorus before the surgery to protecting the uh, bioreflux in the future? No, I think uh, we, we, we don't test. Like, uh, uh, there is the, no matter, no, there is no tool for checking this integrity of the pylorus. It's very tough. You know, only thing you can do endoscopically that if, if the pylorus is open or, or closing. I think a very important uh, technical nuance, again, of not dividing the radical acid artery is to maintain, to maintain as intact the lesser curvatures as we can in terms of preserving the vagus nerve innervation. Uh, yeah. We know, we try to be as more physiologic as we can. We don't have information, but if you have a normal pylorus and preserving some antrum, this, uh, uh, you know, this binomium uh, antrum, uh, preserving some antrum and the pylorus is going to be essential for expelling some bile in the real uh, uh, life that we can have in the antrum. It's like a normal stomach. If you have the antrum functioning and a pyrus functioning, the, the the normal stomach will have some bile there, but the the, the stomach will expel with uh, end and we, we the the gastric emptying will be very physiological. So this is the reason we don't divide the right gastric artery, both to preserve as much vas supply as we can, and to try don't uh, in, don't impairing, you know, don't impair the vagal innervation in this area. Yeah, yeah. As as you see in our videos, we are we are dissecting and sacrificing the right gastric artery away from the wall. Of I, the know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I saw, yeah. I saw, I saw, I saw. But yeah. even so more, you know, don't touch this problem. area. Don't touch this area. We prefer to do that. Except yeah. if you cannot bring up the ileum properly, or you are uncomfortable or not safer, uh, 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 you know, anastomosis. Uh, you can do as you did, very nicely.
Uh, P Professor Abbas, we've got lots of questions about limb lengths. Can you talk us through your uh, your algorithm? How do you measure and what measurements do you usually follow? Yes, I've noticed uh, that question is very interesting and important. I started off, started with two and a half meters uh, from the ileocecal valve. And we noticed that our patients, especially in the MENA region in Egypt, or some of our uh, uh, patients do not uh, tolerate this lens and the incidence of uh, hypoproteinemia and other manifestation of uh, malnutrition are becoming obvious. So should we shifted to three and a half meters for uh, primary cases with BMI less than 50. Mm -hmm and uh, three meters for patient with BMI above 50 and a patient uh, having sad uh, ES as a revisional surgery after sleep because the weight loss is slower. So for primary cases, BMI less than 50, we make it three and a half meters. Above 50, revisional cases after sleep, we go down to three meters. And with these measurements, we have very, very minimal uh, malnutrition and uh, we could not even mention one case that we had to revise patients for hypoproteinemia. Professor Torres, is that your practice as well? Yes, I think, you know, this is the, 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 the best way of managing this, this approach. I agree. Ala, Dr. Wafa. I'm, I'm usually stuck with 300 centimeter because from the paper of Dr. Torres comparing 200, 250, 300, there is no malnutrition in 300 centimeters, so I do 300 centimeters. Fair enough. Right. Professor, Professor Jodet, you've got something to add, please. Well, <laughs> I think, you know, we, we our standard is 250, uh, but because we think, you know, the majority of the patient will do very well, nicely. Yeah. But if the patient is not so heavy, I mean, BMI uh, between 45 and 48 are not very metabolic, I think, you know, SADI 300 is very important. But the both patients that, you know, Dr. Wafa presented are very, very heavy, and they did they are doing very well with 300. But I think long term, if you have a BMI patient like uh, like their, like his patient, uh, 60, 75, uh, uh, and 80, uh, you know, the, the BMI of the... Uh, of uh, uh, his patients uh, are doing well, you know, at six months and one year. But probably, you know, long term, if you have 250, you're going to be getting better result than 300. But anyway, I understand this approach. And I think, you know, it's a very um, safe and a very uh, a nice approach to do 300. I don't have nothing against doing 300. But my, our experience with 250 is long term. We have to be aware that we have long term uh, data of those patients that we did 200. That's true that only 50 patients at the beginning we changed because we had to reoperate it too many patients, almost 10% of the patient. But uh, following up the rest of the patient, I mean, the, 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 the other 38 patients that we didn't operate it after 10 years, more than years, 12 years. Those 35 patients are doing so well regarding weight loss and regarding controlling their comorbidities. Okay. I believe uh, we can spend hours discussing the topic. It's a very, very topical issue. It's a very interesting issue. A lot of people are showing great interest in this procedure. I think we need to wrap up the discussion, but before I do, I would like to go around and ask for final comments. And if you don't mind, I'll start with Professor Jodet. Professor Jodet, can you share with us your thoughts regarding this topic and what take home message you'd like to share with us? Yeah, well, SADIS uh, has a great procedure and with the, with the way we're doing millions of uh, sleeves that are gonna fail eventually, it's gonna be a good salvage procedure. I hope, we, we use this rather than doing a, just one cut transverse and one anastomosis and doing converting into a one anastomosis gastric bypass with a big sleeve. That will probably not be the best for the patients. So I hope we can have more adaptation, but also I hope we have better follow-up for them because these are procedures that need follow-up for life. Professor Abbas? 
Yes, I would like to thank you, and uh, I do really see the future for the but also as a primary metabolic surgery because we are now moving more and more towards metabolic patients with, uh, who are really uh, looking for a treatment of metabolic disease, not just uh, the weight loss. And I think the hurdle in doing this surgery is, is, is not the measurement of the ileum or the hands-on anastomosis, which is the same technique in all other bariatric procedures. It's even easier anastomosis because it's very low down in the abdomen before below the fatty liver. I think the problem is in the dissection of the duodenum, and you have to get, as Dr. Alawaf mentioned, to go to the top people who are doing this and try to uh, slowly get the techniques to safely uh, dissect the duodenum of the head of the pancreas, of the gastroduodenal artery, and get, create a nice uh, long stump that makes the pylorus actually functioning. And uh, I follow in bariatric uh, Brazilian uh, groups who are doing this. They do an, a modification with a very long duodenal stump that is even double the size we've seen from Dr. Alaf on demonstration today. But they have to take care of the common bile duct by doing ICG intraoperative or an MRCP prior to the surgery to, de to define the actual anatomy of that patient so they can go further down and create a longer duodenal stump which in their publication making a, a, a better actual uh, nutritional status for patients with less hypocalcemia uh, with a longer duodenal stump. So there are so many uh, topics to be studied in the future but and it's a very promising procedure and uh, I would advise uh, bariatric surgeon to add it the, the, to their armamentarium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abbas. Dr. Wafa, any words uh, of wisdom to share? Thank you, Dr. Hazem. I think in the future, in the primary cases, SADIS will replace all the procedure in form of super obese patients and in patients with morbid obesity and severe metabolic disease. And in a revisional surgery, I think the best solution for both sleeve gastrectomy with no GERD weight regain is SADIS. Point well received. Professor Torres. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your nice moderation and, you know, for the Ipso uh, Menac, uh, you know, chapter for uh, pointing out, you know, and to bring up, uh, you know, this exciting uh, webinar. Uh, regarding the study procedure, I think going to be is a consolidated procedure at, at present time. You know, I think, you know, it's ideal for a super obese patient, a very metabolic patient. We can discuss 250, 300 approximate studies that they are doing Japanese people and people from Taiwan, you know, in China also. Uh, uh, regarding, you know, the concern, uh, the, the challenging of uh, dealing with the duodenum, as Dr. Uh, Alas said, you know, there are new approaches. Even there is no Dr. D, Victor D from Brazil increasing the length, but going to be too challenging. But another issue is the in, implementing the concept of duodenal bipartition and then, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and then you do to, to deal with this issue and how uh, not to uh, implement the magnetic duodenoiliar anastomosis. It's going to be another way of uh, simplifying the procedure at the beginning for those beginners in this procedure and then coming back and, and, and dealing with the, the completing the study, putting a stapler distally to this uh, duodenoiliar anastomosis. There is, uh, again, you know, new challenges. Uh, Hassan, uh, dear colleague, I think going to be uh, plenty of the future for those guys who can do it. But it's no, no, no doubt that this, uh, pro this uh, procedure works, especially for uh, obese, very obese patient and very metabolic patient. And I think there is no need uh, to think about uh, performing the standard Ruan wilder than suite because SAD is showing to, to get similar results and the standard of the switch, the Ruangwai, is a very consolidated procedure, more than 20 years, with a very outstanding result. I thank you again, Hassan, and all the colleagues. It's a, I think, a pleasure to see you again. Likewise, likewise, Professor Torres. Well, I'll have to bring this, uh, sadly, I have to bring it to an end. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Alatwafa from Libya, first time knowledge and expertise, Professor Jaudat and Professor Abbas from Egypt and the one and only Professor Torres from Spain. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this nice discussion. For our audience, I'd like to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded 
and you can watch it on the IFSO Virtual Academy and our YouTube channel. Don't forget to submit your abstracts for the IFSO Wellborn uh, in uh, 2024, September, and keep the discussion going. All our speakers have got accounts on social media. Don't stop harassing them. Don't stop chasing them. Keep the discussion going. Have a lovely evening, all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Hazem. Take care, guys. Take care, guys. Thank, Have you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Have a nice day.